bloody chiggy, our killer. And two murders in one day. All we need, it really is. We're not sure it's him. I can smell it. And what's happened to George Craig? Sorry, honey. My story. So you're telling me that some old radio drunk is now doing the story? Oh, for God's sake, I am the chief political correspondent. He knows nothing about this stuff. Or television. Bamba, Bamba, would you mind? Thanks very much. George. Back out. Oh, well. And you. The so-called bank manager murderer whose string of killings has shocked the nation has, it seems, this afternoon struck at the very heart of Parliament itself. In the middle of today's bitter law and order debate, Home Office Junior Minister Peter Addison collapsed on Labour's front bench. I was among the first to reach the body, and in my view... You, Constable, what's happening? They've just taken the body away. What are you talking about? They can't do that. Don't you know this place is a crime scene? The sergeant at arms is his ancient tradition, sir. Nobody ever dies in the Palace of Westminster. They die on their way to hospital. Oh, marvellous. Angela, go and bring him back, will you? I'd better go in and sort this little lot out. Right, excuse me. Thank you. See what it means, Geoffrey? A by-election with the government's popularity in a nosedive? You don't think the opposition... No, I wouldn't put it past the bastards, but the point is, this could be our big chance. Voters disillusioned with the new boys, Tories a shambles, and with that superb speech you gave just now. Well, I'd say that this could be the Reform Party's big moment, Geoffrey. Could it? Oh, dear. wonder that Labour MPs of Westminster are in a severe state of shock. George Cragg, BBC News, Westminster. Hey! How about that, then, hey? Brilliant! I bet you're glad you didn't sack him before he got promoted to telly, eh, Ben? <laughs> No, there's no sign of a murder weapon. I didn't hear any final words at all. I'm sorry, no. Why don't we go to the pub? We can talk about it there. I'm dying for a drink, aren't you? Good idea. Well, hardly. It was a packed house. I should say 600 MPs were the last person to see him alive. All right, you were the first to reach him, sir. Yeah, along with that radio reporter, what's his name? George Crack. No, oh, that's where the bugger was. Uh, do you mind? For elimination? Well, I... No. You knew the victim, sir? We all knew the victim. He used to stand up there every day spouting on law and order when the Home Secretary was off somewhere being tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime, presumably. New Labour, you know. He was a junior minister? Yeah. We'd had a chat together just before the debate. He wanted my cross-party support over the bank manager murders. Very sensible. No, not at all. Ask my chap, Henry. Standard practice, lay into the Home Secretary whenever the police cock up, apparently. Not that, uh, I see. So you had a quarrel with the deceased earlier today, is that right? No. As a matter of fact, we sat here and enjoyed a bottle of Perrier Jouet Belle Epoque together. I'm on it, sir. That's an excellent champagne. I'm a Ruddles man myself. That's an excellent beer. See anybody touch the champagne? You're surely not saying, uh, not here. Looks like someone fed him something toxic. Who was at the table? Andrew Mansfield, one of my lot. Dominic Diaz, the money man, you know. Shadow Chancellor took a glass, and I suppose there was Pete the waiter. Uh, sorry, the money man? Economist chap. Governor of the Bank of England's his little brother. Peter Anderson was very chummy with all that city lot. He was a merchant banker, do you see? Was he really, sir? A banker? Well, I'd say that pins the tail on the donkey, wouldn't you? Turn the news on. Yes. Yeah, I know. Look, I'm gonna need some more money. <laughs> okay. of obnoxious, self-opinionated bastards. <laughs> we tend to call them MPs at the Telegraph. <laughs> Here you are. What a surprise. So how were you already at the scene of my crime before it was committed, eh? Phone call, Frank. Our pal tipped me off. He's a real thing, you know, my crank caller. How come you reached the body first? Oh, quick, Frank. Fat but quick. Wasn't a note on him, was there? 
You mean you haven't even searched the body? <laughs> oh, excuse me. Oi! Friends of Peter Anderson. Oh. Oh. Our crime correspondent, George Craig, is at the Commons. George? Yes, hello, Richard. I'm here in the Commons where tonight the atmosphere is sombre. Although some of Peter Anderson's friends have gathered to remember their friend and colleague. Oh, dear Minister, your money supply has ceased as of now. It's him. To them, Peter Anderson was a high flyer. He went to Lansing College in 1985 and became... A Lancer? Chairman of Cambridge University Labour Party. He was headhunted by Battenberg's bank, stood for Parliament in 1992... He is. He's in the bloody pub. ...and so became a junior minister. In fact... Uh, Chief Inspector Frank Jefferson, who heads the inquiry, is here at the scene. Is this the work of the bank manager murderer? Well, it's too He's early got to say, enough. but... Uh, He's got a hand it to We do know that Mr Peter Anderson, uh, formerly a city banker, had had dealings with Oswald Twist, a London broker who was also murdered today. You missed that one, I think, George. Are you any closer to arresting suspects for any of these killings? Any at all? We're working to a detailed psychological profile, and we're confident of a breakthrough very shortly. <laughs> Brilliant, Frank. Uh, a large McCallans for my mate with a profile. <laughs> you haven't a clue, have you, Frank? Oh, all right, George. I haven't got a clue. Yes, you have, though. At the Beeb. My tape of his voice. Look, I'll get quite important to do a room of my own, but only Fat Room's party headquarters. What do you think? Request from the BBC. OK. Didn't make it to the party last night, Henry. Uh, no, I was uh, busy with the party. Uh, this party. Uh, working. Oh. OK, bye. Our deepest condolences, comma, and we in the Reform Party seek to make no political capital out of the tragic death of the member for Talbotting. Yep. Your sincerely, Geoffrey Crichton Potter, MP. And the facts? To the chairman of the Reform Party, Talbotting, this is the big one, exclamation mark. Choose candidate and let's go and stuff the buggers. Hello, my dedicated team! <laughs> See, people are hit. The press are gagging for you already. Henry, your speech was absolutely first rate. I brought the house to its feet. Well, Reform Party leaders have often done that the minute they get up the place empties. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, I mean it. I mean it. What did I say again? Oh, break down law and order, economy thrown to the money men, government driving its citizens to murder. Total bilge, but it sounded good on ITN. Henry, you've no idea how much I rely oh, on you. Oh, I do. Oh, the house went wild. Except for poor old Anderson, of course. He just sort of lay there, sprawled out with his mouth open. Awful thing. It's wonderful, CP. Oh, now, steady on. Mustn't speak ill and all that. Oh, yes, we must. What, what does a dead MP mean? Um, um, well, a, a time for members of all parties to put aside... It means a by-election. You've just given the most successful speech in your career on law and order, and a government spokesman gets bumped off in front of you. We're on a roll, CP, and it starts at one o'clock. Come on. The question then is to what extent have these recent events damaged Labour's popularity? What do you think? Well, yes, I really think it has. And I think what um, Geoffrey Crichton Potter was saying is absolutely right. OK, well, judging by the calls we've had this morning, you're not alone. And that was In the Red, the song all about the murder of uh, poor old bank managers. It's, uh, I think it's number four in the charts this week. Anyway, here's something a bit more tuneful. The windmills of your mind. Like a circle in a spiral. Like a Morning, Martin. God, listen to that. Musical Mogadon for the Dreadon generation. Ooh. Why not get them to play something else? What's the point of being controller of Radio 2 if you can't make them play stuff you like? What, I'm have to climb into my office every day over sacks of evil letters from Biddies in Cheam? Oh, yeah, they hate me, you know. I get these old ladies sending me obscene death threats just because I cut sport on four. I mean, nobody listened to it. Not that that marks it out. This fellow Craig of yours is creating quite a stir with these murders, isn't he? Strong stuff. I should keep my eye on him. 
Yes, yeah, pity we didn't get a well done from the DG. Ah, well, he's had to go off to Cannes, poor thing. A little holiday? A television festival. Oh, of course. Martin, have you a minute? Hmm. Yeah. George Cragg, Crime Correspondent. This is Hercules Fortescue, Mr. Cragg. I would be grateful if you would return to my office. Oh, dear. Is this going to be about your own little problems, George? No, no listen. Much better, George. Your report today, it had colour. That's him. Who is That's it? your killer. You think so? You know who it is. I don't like to be called a maniac. What do you like to be called, then? A public servant. He's bugging about with his voice a bit, but it doesn't sound like a punk, anarchist, anti-government psycho dropout, though, does he? What can you get? Not a lot, I should think. But we'll have a go. Anyway, you're the Beeb, you're the sound people. What do you reckon? Tell you what I reckon. Who's this, then? I'm the headlines. At six o'clock on BBC Radio 4. Gemma White, Radio 4 newsreader. Newsreaders don't dress like that. How do you know? They just sound as if they don't. A lot of these experts will tell you he had access to some kit. Like this stuff here. He's, uh, he's lowered his pitch. He's kept the speed normal. He's taken the top out and wound up the base. Excellent, darling. But I'd say... He just used a hanky. Or something. And talked in a funny voice. <laughs> that is my expert opinion. Is there something wrong with her? I don't know. She's just been having a puff. I'm a police officer. I ought to arrest her. You can't do that, Frank. You'll bugger the six o'clock headlines. So, Martin. The DG. Hmm? Yes, well, he's an excellent man, as I said the other day. He's uh, very committed, very forward-looking. He's a clever man. Martin. I know he's made life difficult for us, Charles, but he's a realist. He has vision. Nice suits. Martin, this is BBC Radio. There's nobody listening. Tell me what you really think. Hmm? There's always... God doesn't work for the BBC anymore. He left when Noel Edmonds joined. All right. He's a crass money banks who's destroying this entire corporation by, by driving out the creatives and handing it over to the managers. I see. He's an ignorant Philistine overpaid bastard who wouldn't recognize a radio if it came up to him, plopped into his lap, switched himself on and said, listen to me, slimeball, and you might actually learn something. Yes, that's pretty much how I put it myself. But he's our Director General, Charles, and I love him like a brother. It's out of our hands. Ah. But is it, Martin? Hmm? Isn't it? Suppose there was some terrible scandal or outrage to hit the BBC. Something that threatened the licence fee. You'd have to resign then, wouldn't you? No, Charles, nobody resigns these days. Meaning it would have to be the most enormous scandal. A disgracefully shocking whopper. You mean something that really sent the biddies into meltdown? I'm talking extended editions of points of view, but a scandal that left radio unscathed. Any ideas? Still climbing up the charts. That's at number three this week. Newcomer Slinky Head with Indirect. Excuse me. Is that the BBC? Yeah. Over there. But I don't like elections. I, I don't understand them. You don't understand politics either. That's never stopped you in the past. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Look, if we agree to this by-election... You don't agree to them, CP. They hold them whether you agree to them or not. Look, a by-election means publicity. It's what a party's built on. You'll be on everything. The Today programme. Oh, I see. No breakfast. World at one. Huh? No lunch, neither. Six o'clock, ITV, news night. Look, CP, what does a politician feed on? Absolutely nothing at all, by the sound of it. Attention. Look, these murders are doing the business for us. Our popularity is shooting up. We're gaining credibility. And losing weight rapidly. Thank you so much. Look, if you insist on having this election, you're going to have to look after it. I need to be here to lead the party. Anita at the Savoy Grill. 
I'm leaving all the thinking business to you, Henry. Splendid testament to your judgment, CP. I'm putting my trust in you. I'm giving you my full support. Now, hop in. I'll stay right here. You don't need me to answer a few questions. But you have my full support. Henry! The World at One. This is Peter Hobday with 30 minutes of news and comment. The headlines. Police announced that the so-called bank manager murderer struck twice yesterday, killing a city broker before the sensational murder of MP Peter Anderson on the floor of the House of Commons. Our crime correspondent, George Cragg, has the story. Chief Inspector Frank Jefferson confirmed last night that Mr Anderson knew Oswald Twist, the second man to die yesterday, apparently at the hand of the serial killer. Go tape. Mr Oswald Twist worked Hello? as a broker in the city. Of Sorry, not now. George Craig's on air. He was having Sorry? Two friends in a wine bar in the city Beth, it's... I think it's... Oh, my God. Uh, how long on the tape? 35 seconds. Right. Put him up. George, I think we've got your caller. Let's go for it. You can't do that. Right. Uh, plug it up. Put a tape on it. I do want to speak to George. It's rather important. I'm here. Hello? Who is this? Excellent, George. I am enjoying your report. Take it to Peter. Mark it. The victims knew each other. How exciting. You're doing a marvellous job. You've murdered a government minister. Isn't it time you gave up? I haven't got to my finale yet. I can't leave unfinished business. I don't believe in senseless killing. That would be senseless. And out. Stay on the line. I want to talk. What's the point of the murders? What are you trying to prove? Take him out. Put him on air. And in a remarkable development, a man believed possibly to be responsible for the killings is now on the line to this studio. No, George. I didn't agree to an interview. I'm going to register a complaint. I'm a licensed payer too, George. That makes you accountable to me. Pick up! Well, the caller rang this studio to express his appreciation of George Cragg's coverage of the case for the BBC. The caller, who had detailed knowledge of the crimes, was put through to me at this desk during the last item. He threatened more murders. I will now be reporting to Chief Inspector Frank Jefferson with full details. In a related development... <laughs> <laughs> Nice one. We've broken every bloody rule in the book. Yeah. Frank, I'll go, Abe. I better go and do him a favour. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'll kill him. Bring George for us, will you? And tell him he better not dare repeat it. And tell him he owes me one. I'd like to see Mr. Dominic Diaz. Would a glass of sherry be timely? Oh, thank you, sir. I understand you were one of the last people to see Mr. Peter Anderson alive. What a frightening business. Your people called me the night it happened. It's possible he was killed by the person they called the bank manager murderer, sir. Thank you. Now, you've commented on the case in the media, haven't you, Mr. Dear? Yes. He's becoming something of a folk hero, isn't he? I gather there's even a pop song being written about him. He's a serial killer. And you're a banker yourself, sir. I'm an economist, actually. Oh, you think he might have been after me as well? Good Lord. Could you tell me what happened? Yes, I had a drink with Peter in the Commons. I've been giving evidence to the Treasury Select Committee on interest rates. I've been a senior advisor to the government for some years now. What, the last lot too? The appearance of change is rather in the eye of the beholder, Inspector. I see. Obviously, you've not seen my text on fiscal theory. It is a seminal work, though I shouldn't say so. Can't honestly say I have, sir. No. No. Well, it's always been my lot in life to be known as brother to the more famous Jack. I don't think I... Uh... His name's Carstairs, my well-known brother. Living proof that intellectual frailty is no bar to advancement in a democracy. Sir Carstairs, the AF. You've heard of him? Oh, yes. Governor of the Bank of England. He's all over the papers himself these days. My point exactly. I advise, but he decides. But then, of course, I have wasted all my years in detailed study and international research, whereas he moved to Islington and went to all the right restaurants. I love him. I'm like a brother. Your health. You ask me about Peter. We were drinking champagne, an excellent Perrier Jouet Belle Epoque, 
I mean, that chap from the Reform Party was there. There was nothing and no one at all suspicious? Not then, no. But later, in the lobby, I noticed a rather odd, youngish man hanging around. He had a word with Peter. He looked very intense, possibly aggressive, mid-twenties, brown hair, rather untidy. Not quite fresh, if you know what I mean. And I noticed he was carrying a bottle of champagne. Any other details you can bring to mind? Leather jacket, I think. Oh, I do remember, he was wearing odd shoes. <laughs> it struck me. I mean, I took him to be a Labour Party researcher, but I think these days even they might draw the line at odd shoes. I'll send somebody about the description. Beautiful stuff you've got here. Well, I'm a collector. Contrary to what we tell the masses, money can in fact buy you absolutely anything you want. I'll have Melton show you out, Inspector. Chief Inspector. And I can manage a door. Well, thanks very much. You've been a great help. Excellent. Inspector. Bye. Not yet, but a giant step for mankind, Angela. I think you've seen our killer. <laughs> That's what you're owed. I'm bored. I need things to happen. You've just got to wait. Now, you understood the deal. You've got to do as you're told. That's how we're going to play this. For Christ's sakes, why don't you get yourself a hobby or something? Mr. Fortescue? Mr. Fortescue? Are you there? Well, one thing's certain, Martin, and that is the timing's right. Is it? Oh, yes, that death in the house was perfect. Everyone's now yapping on about Anderson and his nonsense about the license fee. It stirred all the old biddies out there into a public debate about what they'd get for their money. What do they get? Blankety blank and 2.4 jokes. And the DG wants us to go into bi-media partnership with that lot. It's like taking the crews of the Oxford and Cambridge boat race and booking them aboard the Titanic. He's got to go, Martin. I don't know, Charles. I mean, it's very... Martin, we are talking about a director general of the BBC who thinks that programme making is a waste of a good building. Think how much money he could save on lavatory paper alone if he got rid of all the staff, hmm? And he'd sell off radio to Richard Branson. It's a grim picture. He even so. If the DG fell in a scandal connected with television, Martin, where better to look for a replacement? Oh, good old radio, hmm? There must be qualified people, wouldn't you say? Mm, I suppose there must, yes. The BBC is a rule-based corporation. According to staff instructions, a disciplinary interview, once convened, continues to sit. Mr. Fortescue, do you want something from the canteen? I will not take a meal break until Mr. Cragg returns to that chair. There has been no formal suspension. But they want George Cragg in the newsroom on the murder story. If a member of staff is permitted to ignore the regulatory structures, there is no point. I will not leave this room until Mr. Cragg completes this interview and accepts its findings. Right. OK. Let's hope he falls in the out tray. All right. What about an incredibly expensive television series that gets appalling ratings, scathing reviews, and, and raises serious questions about the misuse of the license fee? That's half the output of the entire corporation, Martin. I don't think the DG would resign everything like that. Okay. What about BBC One? Comedy? Jokes? Sounds an unlikely combination, but go on. A, a satire show. Something really awfully awful. Uh, really gross, offensive, 
ill-conceived, epoch-makingly bad show, a late-night sketch show that attacks God, the government, and the royal family. <laughs> They've already done it, Martin. In fact, sometimes I think it's all they ever do. No, it's got to be more extreme. Something... Something you couldn't transmit at three in the morning on Channel 5. Let alone... But we need people to see it. They might at six o'clock on Sunday night on BBC One. <laughs> what did you say? Six o'clock on a Sunday evening, one. Isn't that songs of praise? Used to be. Until the BBC scrapped it and replaced it with our show. You can't ditch the God slot. It's in the remit. Not ditch it, use it to present the world's first ever smutty religious satire show. BBC One would never make it. Jim Wilkes simply wouldn't buy it, would he? You know, he just might. I wonder what we should call it. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, Charles. Brilliant. That's it, Martin. Oh, Jesus. So what do you think, then? Well, what I don't understand is there's a murderer being broadcast on the radio, and the police still can't catch him. I mean, that reporter, what, what's Craig, knows more about him than they do. Country's falling apart. Yeah. 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 Look, I, I don't want you to talk about politics, all right? I, I just want you to look smart, shake hands and smile, and if you open your mouth, just say the words I put there. If you do that, it's in the bag. Tuesday, yes. Have you seen the opinion poll? Isn't it fantastic? They're lapping up, CP. Look, even Cosmo's got him, most lovable party leader. Oh, I know. Here, public image. For the first time in 94 years, people are actually listening to the leader of the Reform Party. Yeah, of course your opinions count. See you shortly. It was a triumph, I tell you. It was a coup de studio. In fact, George, I'd be honoured to buy you a pint. Buy me an exclusive. Later. I still owe Frank a favour. Plus, he's got a description we could run, which should keep Miss B.A. on as happy if they haven't booted her out. They haven't. And you can forget the pints. You're on every bit of output you've ever heard of. If I'm going to take flat for you, you can earn it. Uh, hush now, little one. And when are you going to get your act together and learn to do that digitally? There's nothing wrong with old technology, darling. It does the trick. So you just put that bit in the wrong way round. Oh, hello. Is he there? Hello, Tony, you old lush. <laughs> oh, come on. Look, I need a favour for a dear friend of mine named Frank. Yep, he's having trouble tracking down a very strict lady of Soho. Initials MS. Yeah, I know it's a silly old cliché, but I just thought of you and that story we never ran in 94. Well, come on, you wouldn't want it to fall into the hands of woman's hour now, would you? You are very clever, Henry. You know, lots of women find cleverness a huge turn. Do they? You could get whatever you wanted if you just really went for it. Uh, do you think so? I know some men are frightened of asserting you. Yeah, well, look, I, I believe in uh, equality. Oh, forget politics. It's just a question of knowing what you want, isn't it? I do, uh, I do know what I want, it's just that, um... Look, I want out of here for a start. I want a proper HQ where I don't have to write breathtaking oratory stuck between a recording studio and a bondage parlour. And I want my party to be in power so I can make lots of money, drive around in a Rolls Royce and have it away with RSC actresses. That's what you want, is it? Well, no. I, I, I mean... I've made a mistake! Oh, honest to God! What is it with you men? Why can you not just say what you want? Oh, God, tell me about it. Are you all right? Probably. I'm Letitia, by the way. We never got as far as me. I'm Jackie. Miss Sin. Oh. You're new here, aren't you? Yeah, I'm working for Geoffrey Crichton Potter, the MP. Oh. Is he the older fat one or the younger thin one? He's the older fat one. Mm. I can murder a coffee. Do you want one? Oh, yeah. Come on up. 86, and they all think they're married to the mystery voice. Sir, 
What? I'm up to me ass in these shoes. Mr. Commissioner. Uh, Frank, no pressure. I just thought you should know that this morning the Home Secretary came to see me in tears. I mean. Most whatever you might think, he's a very sensitive man. So sensitive that he'll probably cut my budget if we don't sort this one out. We have a number of leads. It's a nightmare. Frank. I gather one of them is a uh, Soho lady. Yes, gave one of our corpses a caning the night he died. We only have initials. MS, or so I'm told. George Cragg called me about it. See? It just so happens I have an idea. If you, um, check out this address in, um, Rupert Street. Miss Sin helps submissive males to climb the walls of ecstasy. I have absolutely no personal connection with this lady. Is that absolutely clear? And we could do with something to cheer up the Home Secretary by Friday. You understand? I certainly do, sir. Oh, tell me the good ones. What's this? That's for my Lone Ranger fetishist. He puts on a rubber, I draw two wee black eyes on it and go, who is that masked man? And he says, hi ho silver. And then I whip them with that until the inevitable happens. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. Then there's my client from the House of Lords, who likes to be beaten with a copy of Burke's Peerage. Oh, my God, my dad's the Lord. And uh, what do you do with this? That's for the police dog handler. I put him in that. He barks for a biscuit and rubs his bit. No, you're making it up. You'd be amazed. Mostly I just smack men in their backsides. Oh, God, I sometimes wish I could. You must have met loads of men. Thousands. Mind you, they all look exactly the same from what I see them. Not pretty. If you ask me, all men want to be ruled. You just have to take the initiative. Uh, maybe that's what I should do. Now, would this be about the older fat one or the younger thin one? Uh, it's the younger thin one, actually. That's just as well. You'd never get out alive from under the other one. <laughs> so, uh, what do you do with this? That? The washing up. Most helpful. Ghastly. Forty minutes with two army cadets who wanted me to make more programs about army cadets. And the chairman of a wildlife survival group who claimed I was part of a conspiracy to conceal the truth about badgers. I had a woman who claimed to hang herself if I scrapped you and yours. Oh, hold on. Hello? Oh, yes, darling, yes. I just wanted you to fix up that lunch with Jim Wilkes. Could you do that? Thanks, Jenny. You will never guess what he told me when I went to his office. Jim Wilkes listens to my network. He actually listens to Radio 2. Good God. It just goes to show the man is a boneheaded idiot with the aesthetic sensitivity of a, a pork scratchy. In other words, the controller of BBC One, Charles. Christ. Anyway, he can do lunch. His people are speaking to my people. He said he couldn't fit in an appointment until next month. Then I mentioned lunch and he suggested Thursday. Yes, how are we going to convince him, Charles? Well, simple. We just persuade him it was his idea. No, there's only one real problem. If this program of ours is to be so cringe-makingly bad that the Director General has to depart in disgrace, mm. who's going to make it? I mean, are there producers out there in television with the level of incompetence that we need? Not really. They're all in management. Yes, quite. So, where in the BBC do we find the perfect moron, the true idiot, guaranteed to drop the biggest clangor in broadcasting history? Yes, really, we... He needs someone who's never made a programme in his life. Someone who knows nothing about television. Someone from a department like editorial policy or... Corporate affairs, car park. Someone who's a bureaucratic imbecile. A personnel officer. Oh, my God. It's breathtaking. Is it? What was the name of that man, that total lunatic? Uh, um, Hercules Fortescue. That's, it. Oh, that's brilliant. Except by now he may have starved himself to death. Uh, Helen... See if you can get hold of that man Fortescue. So I did this ten-minute profile of the Governor of the Bank of England, based entirely on the three photos in Hello! magazine. I heard it. Will he run the economy as well as he does his beautiful home? We've only got an hour. Beth wants us back for the six. Well, you know what I say. If you've got to face the music, 
Make sure you can't see straight. Couldn't lend me a five, could you? Why would I give you a fiver, you idle little sponger? So I can pay for a round. If you get it back in liquid form, it's modern economics. You wouldn't recognise modern economics if they jumped out of a cash dispenser with nothing on. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the reform party, is it? Ten pounds, Georgie, for life. Party of principle, I see. Politicians first principle, get elected. Hello. And these bank manager murders are doing you a lot of good, I gather. Oh, yes, best thing that ever happened to us, Henry says. I'm sorry, I didn't uh, quite catch your name. Chief Inspector Jefferson, Scotland Yard. Working hard? Yeah, we're very busy. We're in the middle of a by-election. Well, I'm busy myself. I'm looking for Miss Sin. Oh, she's on the next floor. Good for you. All work and no play. <laughs> the bank manager murders are the best thing that ever happened to you, eh? I'd call that a motive. Come on, you public wait. You better hit the speed for you. What does he mean by his finale? Well, why do I feel he's got it in for me, Max? Not got any bank balances in the family, huh? Well, I look as if I had. Talking of which, you couldn't lend me a ten for some petrol, could you? <laughs> Sorry, I'm busy. Chief Inspector Jefferson. Got the six o'clock itch, have you? <coughs> Excuse me. Wasn't that um... We're not into real names round here, Frank. The area forecasts for the next 24 hours. Viking, North at Sierra South. We've lost New York. South. What do you mean? South. I think Five Live have taken it. Well, get it back then! Where are those two? Just when you think Craig's finally turning into a reporter, I'll fire them both personally. I my tea in the pub, Darren. Woman's Rome doesn't have a financial page, does it? Hurry up, Max. We're nearly on. Damn, we're late. I expect they're just sauntering back from the pub, all mellow. We're going too fast. No, the bloody brakes have failed. It's the bastard murderer. What? one of them from the other end, would you? Name's Inchcape, bank manager. He was murdered in his office last Tuesday. We think he was here with you just before he died. Ah. Uh, yes. He liked being smacked with a rolled-up umbrella. I wondered why I didn't see him again. Hang on. Aha, uh -huh, he'd have left here at about nine. Do you have an alibi for the rest of the evening? She was just pretty busy, but none of them would sign anything, of course. Did Mr. Inchcape say anything about his work at all? Difficult clients, that kind of thing? No. He said he couldn't fulfil himself properly in his professional life. But then they all say that, don't they? Even your commissioner. Oh, you have come across my commissioner. Actually, it was more the other way round. Now look, are you busting me? Or are you like that other DI? 
You want to resist arrest while I punch you in the groin? Would you look at these photos and see if any of them were among your clients? No. No. Oh, I've seen him before. What, he was a client too? No, he was murdered. I've seen him on TV. He was an MP, wasn't he? I suppose you have MPs among your professional acquaintance. Yes, I do. Actually, I share the lease with one downstairs, Geoffrey Crichton Potter, leader of the Reform Party, and a bit of a weirdo. And that young one that works for him is sex-starved, if you ask me, which is very odd. Does he ever wear odd shoes? No. That's Andrew James in the basement. He's made a sort of a flat at the back of the studio place, I think. So in this building, there's a known prostitute upstairs, a bloke with odd shoes squatting downstairs, and a party in the middle that needs murders to get elected. It is Soho, Chief Inspector. Yeah. Jesus. I'm on my way there. Is he all right? This is Angela. I'm at 98 Rupert Street. I want a 24-hour watch kept on this building. Oh, my God! George! George! George, are you all right? Yes. I'm going out. No. No. Hey, Angela, it's Angela. Dear economics correspondent, Enough of stock go economies. Time the brakes were taken off at last. It's him, Beth. It's his idea of BBC accountability. Are you still on air? Yeah, um... Give me that phone! Tom, plug this line up and get Gemma to give George an in. Okay, got it. Gemma, cue in George. He's on the line from reception. And on those bank manager murders, our crime correspondent, George Cragg, has just come in with the latest on that story. The bank manager murderer has just struck again. Though for the first time, without a successful result, the intended victims were myself and the BBC economics correspondent, Max Parker. Oh my God, where is Max? The brakes of whose car had been tampered with. As you can hear, I survived his attempt on my life, as did my good friend, Max. I'm sitting here by the wreckage of his car that has smashed through the doors of the BBC itself. Max, how do you feel about being the first victim apparently to survive the killer? Well, in the circumstances, I can't do better than quote last week's woman's realm. this morning in the by-election at Torbotting, seat of the murdered government minister, Peter Anderson. And after the attempted murder of BBC reporters George Cragg and Max Parker yesterday, the failure to catch the killer is expected to cost the government a large number of votes on polling day. Opinion polls... <laughs> How long have you been locked in your office? Seven days. I haven't really eaten it. Well then, you must have this. Do sit down. I didn't mean to. I... I've not had a happy life. No, listen, listen. We've called you here at the direct request of the Director General. We've assured him we can count on your absolute discretion. Isn't that right? Of course. The Director General? Yes. Do you know who that is up there on the wall? Lord Reith, the great founder. Quite so. The great founder. And a very great man indeed. Except, of course, as you and I both very well know, he got things badly wrong, didn't he? Lord Reith got it wrong. Oh, yes. You see, he had a very old-fashioned view of human nature. He believed that life began in the primeval slime, but that people got better and better, until one day broadcasting arrived, and all they would ever want would be Beethoven concerts, endlessly presented by announcers in invisible dinner jackets. Unfortunately, as our present DG has taught us, none of this was true, isn't it? Audience research has shown us that people are moving quite the other way. Back from Beethoven toward the primeval slime. Do you realize there are people out there with nails through their navels? That's our target audience, Fortescue. These are the people the DG wants us to reach. And quite frankly, we're failing. The DG wants our best people brought in. He wants our best and brightest fast track to the top, and that means you, Hercules. But I'm not doing very well. I've specifically ordered a radio journalist to start an attack. Frankly, Fortescue, 
If you have ambitions for a top post within this corporation, I should learn to take a more relaxed view. A relaxed view. The DG is looking for a new breed of producer for the broadcasting of the millennium. And in a flash of inspiration, we thought of you. You want me to produce a radio program? No, 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 no. We want you to produce a television program on the nation's premier network. On BBC One, Hercules. And Q. As polling day approaches, campaigning here in Torbotting is hotting up. And with Labour's comfortable majority transformed into anger and suspicion, and the Conservatives little more than a novelty party, the Reform Party has been pulling out all the stops to extend its already commanding lead. It is a political force whose day seems truly to have come. Could you tell me your policies on you? We're for it. It's only ten pounds to join if you just sign here. Mm -hmm. God, Henry, I'm exhausted. So many people have joined. Don't drop yet. We've got to get a campaign bus, we've got to raise election funds, and we've got to get out on the doorstep. And I really must write some policies. Yeah. No, the other parties are all over the shop. New Labour aren't new anymore. They can't catch the murderers. And as for the Tories, well, quite frankly... What? No. Yes! All right. First opinion poll. Labour, 34%. Tories, 19%. Reform, 37%! Yeah! 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 We're in the lead! We're going to win! We're going to pinch it off the government! Oh, it's fantastic, Henry. I really don't see how it can go wrong. Well, hang on. I want to join the Reform Party. I want to help the tall body. OK, sure. Name? My name's Andrew James. And the address? I live here. Downstairs in this building. You sure you've never seen me before? Over here, Mr. Wilkes. Shall I bring you your scotch? No. Ah, oh, Jim. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Well, three controllers in one room, eh? Quite an occasion. Mr. Wilkes? Well, I'm a give-me-egg-and-chips man, as I always tell the papers, but if you want to give me the steak chambertin with a radicchio and fennel salad, I won't complain. Well, I don't know what life's like in Broadcasting House, but I've got a huge empire to... What's this? Uh, the amuse bush, I believe. Well, it's about as amusing as my viewing figures. We'll wait for the proper food. Thank you. Ratings in trouble, Jim? Oh. Bloody terrible. And I'm a ratings man. I know what these Oxbridge types say about me. Old Jim's not got too much up top, but he's a bums on seats man. And when they aren't on the seats, I'm in trouble. And you know why it is, don't you? Tell me. Because half of what we broadcast on one is crap. Yes. I think it's your weekends, really, isn't it? I mean, uh, look at your Sunday nights, for example. Well, please do. Nobody else does. Well, it's the God slot, isn't it? I mean, they turn over in droves. Actually, um, Martin and I have been brainstorming your god slot, haven't we, Martin? It's, it is worrying. Hang on a minute. Why is radio worried about my figures all of a sudden? What's my god slot got to do with you? A very great deal, Jim. The whole credibility of the BBC it depends on it reaching roughly 50% of the audience. And if we're talking about audience reach, we're talking about BBC One. If BBC One is shaky, then we won't get a decent license fee. And then what's the future of radio? All right, go on. So, what's your idea? Well, Martin and I were talking about songs of praise, actually. Lovely, Martin. Watched by 4.5 million, predominantly over 55 C2D2s, who like the religious content. But who doesn't watch it, Jim? Hmm? There are 5 million, 25 to 65, ABC ones turning over to the natural world for speech-based entertainment, which doesn't make them feel guilty about not going to church. There are six million, 35 to 55s, watching ITV for the news, and there are three million under 25s who want fast-moving cult entertainment, who are watching Channel 4 game shows or just lying on the sofa waiting for Star Trek to come on. <sighs> Bloody marvellous. So what you're saying I need is an irreverent, speech-based, topical, fast-moving cult entertainment show with religious content. What a brilliant idea. <laughs> 
I wonder if this might help. Bamba Simpson, BBC. Mr. Boot Heath, what's your attitude on Britain's membership of the European Community? Well, I'm fundamentally... Mr. Boot Heath broke. would like to see Britain at the centre of the new Europe whilst retaining its distinctive heritage and independence. Mr. Boot Heath, Mr. Boot Heath, Mr. Boot Heath, what do you see as your main issue of this election? Is it local concerns? The main issue the of any... The Reform event. Party believe the central issue for local people is the appalling performance of this government, especially in the economic sphere and on the question of crime. Does Mr. Boot Heath have opinions on anything? Absolutely not. He has convictions. Anyone else? <laughs> Oh, I like it. I like the idea of this Fortescue. Just think how good it looks when I tell the DG that we're actually moving bureaucrats out of the office into the studios to make programmes. Oh, it's a stroke of PR genius. Yes, get the DG's backing. He can claim it as a new initiative. I want to meet this man. I don't want one of these daft creative types. His name is Hercules Fortescue. Oh. Is he all right? He's been working so hard recently, he's not been eating properly. Yeah, Hercules, come and sit down. This is Jim Wilkes, controller of BBC One. Oh, God. Exactly, mate. Now, look, this is the bottom line. I've got a very big job, and I need a rising star to take it on for me. I'm launching a new satire programme on Sunday nights, and I want you to produce. I, I will be delighted, controller. You see, I've never... I've never I've, I've, I know you've never. That's why I want you. I want new ideas, new attitudes, new writers, new bloody viewers. Can you or can't you? Uh, of course you can, Hercules. I take a relaxed view. <laughs> There's just no sign, Gov. He's not been back. Right then, we'll go in. Stand by. So, uh, have you got the warrant yet, Frank? George, what I've got is an emotional home secretary and a commissioner who's going to ask us if I want to spend more time with my family. So, Ways and Means Act, all right? All right, in we'll go, lads. Go, go! <laughs> James, any further use of your card will therefore constitute an offence for which you may face prosecution. El Cartwright, Croydon. Uh, half the population get letters like that, Frank. This one, Gov. Dear Mr. James, I am compelled to withdraw your facility. J. Addison, Midwest Bank tooting. Bingo! At last. Well, what do you make of that, George? You brought me your office outing. Where is he? The blogo lives here. He's involved with the reform lot. They've all gone off campaigning to that place. Talbotting, isn't it? Folk reform. These men are dead. You could be next. Folk reform. Don't die for their mistakes. Folk reform. Oh, we are doing brilliantly, Henry. Well done. Yeah, we're not so keen on our canvases spouting bloody murder quite so graphically. And we could do the candidate who's got an IQ higher than his shoe size. <laughs> yeah, we need CP, don't we? Yep. The moment has come, except it'll be at some radical alternatives to poverty lunch at Marco Pierre White's. No, I think it was an anti-vivisection league dinner he had, actually. Well, he can tell them to eat their hearts out and get himself up here. There's a tide, Letitia, and the Reform Party have finally got the surfboard. Jeffrey Crichton Potter asked them to vote reform and bring in a new millennium. This is your party leader, Jeffrey Crichton Potter, asking you to vote reform and bring in the millennium. Henry, I really don't like talking What's going on? It's the police. It's over. Oh, 
I'm looking for Andrew James. Have you got a warrant? He's not here. He's got his own van for canvassing. Can't you hear? Follow the van. Get some backup. There's an election inspector. People are making their democratic decision. There's also a little matter of six murders. What the hell was that? Where? On your way. Make that seven and count it. He's bombing the southern banks. Right here in Talbot. <laughs> You have no idea how many regulations this... Who exactly was responsible? Yeah, George Craig, I think his name was. Excuse me. Excuse me. Chief Inspector Jefferson, can you tell us what happened? He was loading his cash dispenser and it exploded. A similar device was used across town. Does this bear the whole marks of the bank manager murderer? Yes, it does, George. Excuse me, officer. We are bank managers here in Tarbotting, and we're disgusted at your incompetent handling of these crimes. Lives are at risk here, you know. We could all be dead by tomorrow. How do the police react to the beaming of the public that they don't sleep safe in their bed at night? You bastard, George. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me, please. I appreciate your concern, but we will give you all the protection we can. A suspect is being pursued as we speak. I anticipate that an arrest is imminent. Well, where is he then? Go! <laughs> My God, he surpassed himself. It's in the bag. We just sit tight, stay cool, and make some history.